Yeah, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Stefan Pichler. I am Vice Director for Research at uh, VU, Vienna University of Economics and Business. And on uh, behalf of the Rector of uh, VU, I have the honor to welcome all of you uh, in the busy time before Christmas uh, to today's edition of VU Matters, VU Talks, titled What are the Costs of Violence? and today organized by the Department of Economics to all the representatives of the department. A big thank you, first, for organizing this event, and second, for organizing also a reception after the event in the neighboring uh, lecture hall. And our event series, uh, VU Matters, VU Talks, is aimed uh, to communicate research results to a broader community, to the broader uh, public, and in most of the events, or nearly all of the events, we select a very current topic that is discussed, that is reflected, based on academic research. But we do not present academic research itself in the form of an academic paper or a, or a monograph. But uh, this evening, uh, this lecture is a little bit of an uh, exception. Um, we are not only uh, given an indirect channel of, of, of research communication, uh, we will have a presentation of a concrete uh, research article published in one of the leading academic journals in social sciences. And the author of this article, Professor Anke Höffler from the University of Oxford, is here uh, at VU to present the paper uh, tonight and discuss the results. And I think that the organizers of this evening have selected this single paper version uh, of this event because this paper is important. It shows extremely striking results and it's very relevant also for policy and society. And when I first read the title of today's event, I was a little bit unsure about the combination of the two keywords, violence and costs. And of course, this is the University of Economics and Business, and the organizing department is the Department of Economics, and, and therefore it should be somehow natural to talk about the costs of something uh, that is related to the economy. But on the other hand, isn't it immoral to quantify human lives or injuries, to monetize experience pain and harm, or to think one step ahead when we start talking about the costs of violence, isn't there a risk that someone else starts talking about the benefit of violence? Benefit for the sake of the country, the king, the people? And at least in the German-speaking countries, there exists obviously a very bad collective memory of a very bureaucratic justification of extreme violence. However, I had the advantage that there is a research article behind the title of this talk, and I read the paper. And after reading the paper, I immediately understood that talking about the cost of violence is far away from being immoral. Now I would say it is immoral not to talk about it. But I do not want to spoil the lecture by explaining which arguments convinced me. You can trust me, they did. And let me only add one minor remark that is related to, to, to the forthcoming talk. Let us call it a teaser. So Professor, Professor Höffler shows uh, that the total costs of, of violence uh, caused by intimate partner assault, so just within a, a, a partnership, so completely unrelated to wars or, or terrorist attacks or rampages, these costs sum up to more than 5% of world GDP per year. 5% of world GDP per year. And as a finance professor, I immediately tried to compare this number to the costs of financial crisis. Yeah? And according to, to studies published by the, by the Fed and others, we estimate the total costs of all financial crises in modern history sum up to 2% of annual global GDP. So just this intimate partner assault violence costs are 2.5 times the cost of all financial crisis, just to give you uh, some uh, relation. This is just end of spoiler alarm. Uh, 
Yeah, before I start uh, uh, to give my own lecture here, and believe me, I feel somehow tempted to do so, let me hand over to uh, the moderator of today's evening, Professor Jesus Crespo Curesma. He's head of the Institute for Macroeconomics, and Professor Crespo will briefly introduce our speaker and will later act as the moderator of our discussion. Jesus, please. So good evening, uh, everybody. My name is Jesus, and uh, I'm here not only as a professor uh, of macroeconomics at the department, but also as a deputy head of the department since uh, today's uh, edition of VU Matters. VU Talks is also uh, the VU lecture of our department, which is something that we are particularly proud of and uh, whose edition today is the eighth edition. We started this uh, tradition eight years ago where we invite every year somebody to present uh, Research Frontier uh, results to a broader audience of uh, uh, students, uh, other academics, policy makers, and so on. And today, it's a particular pleasure to welcome uh, Anke Höfler. Anke studied in, in Würzburg and London in the Beerbeck College and uh, did her PhD in Oxford, where she's a research officer at the Center for the Study of African Economies in St. Anthony's College, which I had the, the pleasure to visit uh, seven years ago. And I was super fascinated by the, the energy of, of research that takes place at the center. Uh, on top of that, since I think officially since some hours ago, <laughs> she's also uh, the holder of the Alexander von Humboldt professorship. She was nominated by the University of Constance and got uh, uh, this, this professorship, which is uh, the most highly endowed um, research award existing in Germany right now. Uh, 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 Anke's work, um, or, or uh, how I got to know Anke's work was through her work on, on the determinants of civil wars. There are two very, very influential papers by, by Anke and, and Paul Collier. I checked it out this morning. Uh, both of them got published in, in the Oxford Economic Papers, and together they have over 11,000 citations, so that's quite something. And uh, that was the, the, the beginning of a longer term relationship with the effects of conflict on economic growth and economic development, and now going in the direction of moving away from widespread civil conflict to obviously uh, issues related also to interpersonal violence, which appears particularly uh, fascinating and, and interesting and that I'm really looking forward to, to hearing of. So, Anke Höfler. Well, dear Vice Rector, uh, fellow uh, professors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation to uh, talk to you about an incredibly uh, important uh, topic. So, how do I get the first slide? Good. Okay. So, what are the costs of global violence is the overarching question. Um, it's um, a couple of papers we've done and we are preparing this as a book. When I say we, it's joint work with political scientist Jim Fieron in Stanford. So, what are the costs of war? That's probably what springs to your mind first of all when I say violence. So, what happens in a war is that people get killed. Yeah. Civilians get killed, um, soldiers get killed, um, and it's widespread destruction. In particular of infrastructure, yeah, bridges are very often um, um, are destroyed and, and roads, ports and airports. Uh, so it's a very, very difficult for economists to recover from this. So when I say I want to calculate the total cost, um, it's going to be some sort of number of cases. So how many people die and what are their lives worth? Um, and then there are going to be some economic costs. Yeah. So the bridges and um, all the infrastructure that, that gets destroyed. So this is sort of roughly how I want, to, I want you to think about it in this, in this equation. Many of you will have no interest whatsoever to put a price on people's lives. Yeah? So maybe all of you who don't want to think about this, just sort of think about prevalence rates, so the number of people who are um, killed or injured in, in um, 
in violent uh, incidents. So where is this violence? So um, the Scandinavian institutes are particularly good if you need some data on this. This is from UCDP, so this is the Uppsala Conflict Data Program. Um, it's always, we're always lagging a little bit behind. This is the most recent map from 2016, but in 2017 and 18, unfortunately, looked very similar. So we've got a lot of conflict, so the darker, the more people get killed. Um, it's the Middle East, Pakistan and parts of, of Africa are um, those that have um, a lot of conflict. So this graph just sort of shows you a little bit historically since the end of the Second World War up to today, how many conflicts, just the number of cl conflicts there were. So you can see it sort of went all up and then the end of the Cold War means there's not so much opportunity to finance these or the proxy wars stop. So that then the number of conflicts goes down and then more recently it's gone up again. Yeah? We don't know whether this is a longer term trend or whether this is just a blip, we, we don't know as yet, I'd say. What do the different colors mean? So the yellow ones are um, what most of you will think of as civil wars. Of course, there's nothing civil about them, yeah? but this is sort of typically, so these are internal armed conflicts. Um, the gray ones have got international involvement, so they're stuck just on top of each other. Yeah? The blue ones are colonial wars, they don't exist any longer. Mozambique, um, 75 was the, um, the last one, and Angola, so they don't exist any longer. And the dark orange ones, uh, international wars t between two countries. So you see immediately the big issue are these so-called civil um, conflicts. Yeah? And how are they defined by these Scandinavian um, data collectors? Um, you have at least 25 deaths um, per year to have a minor armed conflict or, or a thousand um, or more for a war. Um, you could, of course, have a relative number, so, you know, like half a percent of a population killed. But then you need a, lo a lot of deaths in China and only two deaths in the Turks and Caicos Islands. So this is the sort of definition that um, political scientists uh, use. In order to be a um, state-based armed conflict, you have to have an opposition group that fights the government. And there has to be effective resistance. Yeah? If a government goes around and kills people, then this is a pogrom or a massacre or um, a genocide, but not a civil war. Yeah? And these deaths that give you the definition of whether this is a armed conflict or not are, are, are civilian and military deaths. Yeah? Because what happens in most of these modern wars is not that two armies fight each other, but that both armies actually go around and kill civilians. Yeah? Um, what is not part of it is there are of course a lot more people who die in wars not because of direct violence, but because of hunger and disease. They're not counted in this. So how many people get killed? So this is basically the end of the Cold War up to today. And immediately you see this big orange column. That's the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. Um, um, the different colors give you different types of, um, um, of, of killings, basically. The gray ones, so I'm going to sort of show you the same, this is exactly the same graph now without the Rwanda column. The red ones are the one-sided violence. This is the Rwanda style, you know, sort of civilian mass killings. Um, the blue ones are non-state conflict. So sometimes you get two groups in a country that fight each other without the state really getting involved very much. So it's very little. And the big numbers really come from these state-based conflicts where you have an organized opposition group that can inflict um, um, deaths. Okay, and what can we see in the sort of last few years to give you an order of magnitude? It's sort of under 140,000 deaths a year. 
it's a lot of people, but we'll see um, how that compares. Now, if I move on from dead people to the, um, you remember my little equation, there were economic costs. So, as economists, we can sort of think of wars as a recession. So, I've shown you over time the GDP, um, so how much a country produces over time. This is from the um, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and you can see it sort of crashes down and then goes up again. What happened here was a really, really big war, the Congo War. Um, it's not really peaceful before and not really peaceful after, but this is the really bad period yeah, that the Scandinavians sort of say was the Congo War. So what, how much did this country lose? What's the cost of this war? What have we foregone during this period? How do we want to think about this? Well, what do you compare it to? A sort of hypothetical Congo without a war? Um, and what would have happened in this counterfactual that you have to think about? You can, of course, be charitable and sort of say maybe the income would have stabilized here and then the difference between the actual and the hypothetical one um, is, is the economic loss. Um, you could say, okay, if hypothetical Congo had grown like the neighboring comparable countries, then the economic loss would be between the blue dotted line and the actual blue line. And this is sort of how economists sort of try to sort of assess what if, yeah? Um, and you can see immediately that depending on which assumptions you take, the economic loss is quite small or quite large, yeah? Okay, so um, this is sort of how we think of this sort of second part of the economic costs, a hypothetical Congo. Um, and here we are thinking really of the average um, uh, of the average growth in comparable countries. Yeah. So the number of cases are just the deaths, um, and we have these from the Euro uh, from the Scandinavian Peace Research Institutes. Then I'll talk a little bit more in uh, later during the talk about what what is the price of life. And then here we have a sort of counterfactual or synthetic country uh, that gives us this. Yeah. Okay, but as was already show, uh, said in the introduction, um, war doesn't equal violence. There's lots more violence. I mean, violence, um, when you open the newspapers and you see that there are now finally peace talks about Yemen and um, still pictures on Syria and the Ukraine, um, that's maybe the first thing you think of, of violence. But this is, um, these are flowers in London for a young man who was stabbed to death. Um, quite a wave of these sort of types of um, deadly crimes. This is from a police raid um, these are dollar notes, um, Kalashnikovs, um, other um, firearms, drugs. Yeah, so a lot of organized um, violence. Then there's a, a scene of um, domestic violence and um, against a woman and against a child. I've talked mostly about women and children. I always, in the Q&A, get some questions about men, and I'd be happy to talk more about violence against men in the domestic sphere, but there's not as much, and we also don't know very much about it, but we, we do know a little. Okay, so if we just sort of then broadly define violence as any action that uses force intended to cause harm. Now, when you um, go to the article that I published in the um, Journal of... Um, politics, philosophy, and economics, you can, of course, dissect all of these words. What is force? What is harm? Uh, what is intention? How do you ever sort of find out what intention is? But maybe as a minimum definition, we could sort of um, ag agree on this, because this goes, violence would be a nuclear bomb to slapping a child. Yeah, that is a sort of pretty encompassing um, definition here. Now, how costly is this violence, is what I'm asking myself. 
And why should we quantify this? We've already had a skeptic here. Um, so with a common metric, yeah, because I'm going to tell you this costs you so much in, ter in, in dollars, um, you can sort of say what the size of the problem is. And you can compare. You can compare across different types of violence. You can compare across time. You can compare across countries and regions. You could also, in principle, do a uh, cost-benefit analysis, CBA. Um, you can sort of say it costs us that much as a society, and um, um, if we sort of put interventions in place to um, prevent violence or decrease levels of violence, would that be cost-effective? And for all the skeptics amongst you about putting a price on life and doing a CBA, um, which I'm not going to do today, is every traffic department in any country does this. Yeah? So here in Vienna, there will be traffic junctions where people die. And once you've had three traffic deaths or something, the department for traffic control will sort of say, OK, we need to have a speed control here and this and that and the other, um, because it's a cost-effective thing to do that. Yeah? So I'm not as outlandish at it as it might uh, uh, um, seem. And also, in my experience, it really adds weight to a policy debate. It makes people sit up when they hear big numbers. Right. So, let me ask you some questions then that we'll try and um, answer in the remaining time. So, which societies have high costs of violence? And which type of violence is most costly? And who is most affected by violence? Yeah. Okay, so let's just sort of think again in terms of categorizations. We have collective violence. So I've already talked quite a bit of collective, about collective violence. We've seen there isn't much international war. The UN has become very, very good at sort of clamping down on these. Um, or as an international community, we've become very good. Eritrea and Ethiopia have a very complicated history. Uh, Eritrea broke free from Ethiopia after 30 years of independence war. Um, but when the two countries were independent and fought each other, it was basically a 30-day war. Just to give you some sort of idea how good we've become, you know, sort of to stop these things. Mostly it's an issue of internal armed conflict. Then there's the one-sided conflict. Yeah, you remember the genocide in Rwanda column. There's non-state violence, so for example, between Hindus and Muslims in, 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 in India. Please note that I haven't used the word terrorism. That's probably also a type of violence that is really on people's mind these days. But this, there is really no good social science definition of what terrorism is. Terrorism really comes under this sort of one-sided violence. So the first map that I showed you actually had a little dot around Nice and, you know, wherever, you know, these sort of terrorist attacks were. So they accounted in this sort of one-sided violence. And then, so we've sort of had a whistle-stop tour of this type of violence. But what there is also is interpersonal violence. So luckily, this is rare. Yeah? You read about it a lot and it's on your minds, but this is rare. Most of the world is at peace. What every society has are homicides. Yeah? So these are murders as well as um, manslaughters. Every society has physical assaults, and there's sexual assault and rape. Um, there's, in particular, a lot of violence in the domestic sphere from the intimate partner. And there is violence against children. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the data here. There is a lot more evidence now that the elderly are also suffering a lot, of, a lot more violence. Um, very difficult to quantify at the moment. There are no, no good data, so I won't show you anything on that. And if you're disabled, then you're also much more likely to um, experience violence. Again, unfortunately, not very good global data um, that I can do anything about. Now, please note that in my... Um, so you, you can see a pretty full slide here, but of course, 
I'm neglecting a lot of types of violence here. So for example, self-directed violence, suicide, self-harm and suicide, I'm excluding here. Um, I'd quite like to do something more in future research on the overlap of these types of violence and, and suicide. And then also violence against nature, against the planet, um, and also violence against uh, animals is not something I'm going to uh, consider today. So let's talk about some homicide rates. So typically this is the area of study for criminologists, and they don't think in terms of absolute numbers like these civil war researchers, they think in terms of per 100,000. And this is how they compare it. So the first column gives you the ratio, so the ratio of per 100,000. So El Salvador, Honduras, Venezuela, Jamaica, they are on top of the leaderboard here. They're really very violent places. And they're basically all Latin American countries with a few African countries. Yeah. Um, the World Health Organization from... Um, so I'm going to use quite a bit of World Health Organization data or UN Office of Drugs and Crime Statistics. Um, they sort of say that um, it's, it's a problem once you're over 10. That's the sort of rule of thumb. Um, as a comparison, um, Austria is very similar in that respect to Germany. Very low rates, so it's not even one per 100,000 the population, and the US is about five times more violent, to give you some sort of idea of maybe countries that you're, f you're familiar with. Okay, but now, look, Brazil has got a really high homicide rate, 27 per 100,000, and that in 2015 gives you more than 55,000 people killed. As a comparison, the civil, Syrian civil war killed about 45,000 people in that year. You've got the headlines here in the papers, but not about Brazil, or at least not in the same way. These homicides really do stack up to an awful lot of uh, lost lives. Um, and in my book, Every body counts, every dead body ought to be counted here, yeah? no matter how people die. So remember we had about 140,000 people killed, not even, um, in these um, different types of collective violence. Um, homicides kill a lot more people annually, yeah? so it's about just un under half a million for a typical year. Who are the victims? Well, this is a male issue. Men get killed. Men kill and get killed, and mainly young, young men. So about, so it's the bluish, purpley ones. So 77% of all homicide victims are male. Um, luckily, very few child, children are homicide victims. Only 7% of all homicide victims are children. And then women are the sort of two red triangles here. Interestingly, 40% of all women worldwide who are killed are killed by their current or former intimate partner. It's a bit of an unwieldy expression, intimate partner. In most places in the world, this is a husband, yeah? a husband or a boyfriend. So for women, statistically speaking, the most dangerous person in your life is your husband or your boyfriend. Yeah? Um, so... Men also get killed in intimate partnerships. Um, these are basically all stranger murders or, or manslaughters. But then also um, some women kill their, um, kill, kill their husbands. And interestingly, they have got something in common with the um, women who get killed by their violent husbands. Um, there's been typically a history of violence, of, um, of violence in the household before these murders. Women very often kill after years of sustained abuse. Yeah? 
and also the women who get killed in intimate partnerships typically have had some for the countries where we know this quite well, in the United Kingdom and in, in other places, they've typically already had interventions from the police um, be before that. Okay, so I said that children are luckily rarely um, victims of um, homicide. But when you sort of see per 100,000 children, new, these are newborns, yeah? So this is within the first month of your life and then in between, and then these are young adults. These are 15 to 29 year olds. And what do we see? This is globally. This is a global um, thing. So it's this big red column. This is girls, newborn kill girls being killed in Asia. That's basically what it means. And this big, big blue column is basically a Latin American young men. Yeah? It's a major cause of death for young men in Latin America. Um, who kills? The, let's forget about these for a moment. Um, these are young adults. These are stranger killings, typically. Um, newborns, they're killed by their parents. Children are killed by their parents. Yeah? Especially the newborns, it's basically any parents who've got access to them and they're being killed by their parents. So for countries, again, for which we have got good statistics, when children are killed, remember, it's a very rare occurrence, it's none of this sort of your child's being grabbed from the bus stop and killed, dragged behind a bush and killed. That's extraordinarily rare. When children are killed, it's 80% their parents. Yeah? And the other percentages are usually the sort of step parents or football trainers or, you know, people who've got access to, to, to children. But it's mainly parents who kill children. What about non-fatal violence against children? So there's, of course, violence everywhere against children. It's in schools, so in a lot of schools, children get hit. Um, they experience this in the community. Many children are in prisons across the world. They work across the world um, or in institutions like orphanages and so on. But according to experts, most of the violence happens at home. Yeah, just like you know, who kills them, it, the non-fatal violence also comes from, again, it's a bit of an unwieldy expression, caretaker, uh, or caregiver, but it's basically the parents and very often the mothers. Um, so how do we define violence against children? Because, you see, I need to measure this. Yeah? I want to come up with this cost estimate and tell you something about the cost. So I need to know how many children are being hit by their parents. It's a type of violence that nobody observes other than the perpetrator and the victim. So one way is to ask people. So you can ask children from a certain age, but um, the best comparative data that we've got is where parents, so care, caregivers, are being asked. Um, your child did something wrong in the last month. What did you do? You can sort of say, um, I told him that this was wrong. I grounded her, um, that sort of non-violence disciplining tactics. Or you can say, I shouted at her, you'll never amount to anything, you're terrible, you're dumb. Yeah? That's um, um, psychological aggression. These psychological aggressions are probably really, really bad for people. Yeah? Violence, you remember my definition, is anything that intentionally causes harm. It does this, this, this cause harm, tremendous harm. But it's so very difficult to measure that I'm not going to consider this. And then you can sort of say, I gave him a smack on the bottom with my bare hand. Yeah? So this is a physical punishment. And it's, it's asked in great detail. Or you can sort of say, um, well, I took my belt, my cane, another implement. Americans have a paddle just for, for that single purpose, and really, really hit my child repeatedly as hard as I could. Yeah? So I'm get, apart from the non-violent discipline, to my mind, all of these things are violence against children. But it's very difficult to get a consensus 
across different cultures what violence against children is. So in our work at the moment, we concentrate on the severe punishment. So it's with an implement repeatedly as hard as I could. Um, so when you ask parents, what do they tell you? So in high income countries, only very few parents say that they did this. And then middle income countries and low income countries, they tell you that um, they use this quite a lot, this severe disciplining force. So, what does this tell us? Is this data that we can trust? Um, it's the only broad, big evidence that I've really got. In high-income countries, here in Austria, you'd probably ask somebody about how they discipline their child and there'd be a taboo about hitting your child. So they'll probably under-report this. But you might actually get a Kenyan father to overstate this, because if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Yeah? You have to be a harsh disciplinarian to be a good parent. So, you've got to be very careful with these data. Um, there's probably some under and possibly over-reporting in, in, in certain countries. But it is something that's been asked across the globe of a lot of parents. What about non-fatal violence against women? So again, it's very often not observed. It mainly happens in, in the domestic sphere, um, not only by intimate partners, by their husbands and boyfriends, but also by their mothers-in-law, fathers-in-law, uncle, etc. Um, and across the world, um, women sort of state that, um, so it's about 12% of women state that they've been um, assaulted um, in, the, in the past year, 12% of women. And over a lifetime of the average woman today, it's a third of all women say that they've experienced this during their lifetime. And there's enormous underreporting. So very few women go to the police or to anybody because they feel it's part of being a woman. It's something that women have to bear. Who would you tell? It's the norm in a lot of societies. So um, it's, it's very often not talked about. Again, there are data efforts from the demographic and health surveys. They've got a domestic violence module. So this is a big series of surveys where women are being asked one-on-one -on -one in interviews in a safe situation, in a private atmosphere. Um, have you had the follow, you know, following happening to you last year, um, um, during the past 12 months? And it's sort of like being pushed, shoved, burned, pulled on your hair and so on. And then um, the, question, the next question is, who did this to you? Yeah. So here it's a little bit different. It's, uh, I've got high income, and then I've got the different regions, not by income then. Um, so these are all middle and low, low income countries. And Sub-Saharan Africa is the region with um, the poorest countries, poorest populations as a world region. And here again, we sort of see um, evidence that more women state that they've um, um, that they've been assaulted by their by their intimate partner. Again, this might be very. Um, this is again. This is self-reported data. Yeah, nobody's nobody's witnessed this. But I think what you should take away from it is with these graphs is that the richer countries are, the less this appears to happen, and the poorer uh, regions are, the more this seems to happen. Okay, these are just different, uh, it's a different way of sort of showing these, these prevalence rates. So the cost of violence you can think of in many different ways. You can think of, um, so, I've talked about these different types of, um, uh, types of violence, collective and inter interpersonal. And now I just want to sort of um, come to the last bit of my talk where I give you a few numbers. Yeah? And how can we think of the cost of violence? They are obviously costly to the individual. Yeah? If I get assaulted in the street, then I might not be able to work. Um, there are um, um, care costs in my community and in my family. Um, there's societal costs, yeah, because if there are lots of assaults, you might not want to have a shop there, 
yeah, and might not want to invest, and maybe to the world at, at, at large. This is my example of an assault, but you can think of different, um, dif different types of um, violence and their cost. So back to my little equation. I'm an economist after all. So the, um, the I'm going to talk a little bit more now about the price of life. Yeah. So um, they're going to be this VSL, the virtual um, um, value of a statistical life, VSL statistic. And this is about depending on the study, it's about eight or nine million uh, US dollars for the United States. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute how we derived this. And the displacement of legal activity and lower productivity is an economic cost of, these inter of the interpersonal violence. Yeah? If there are a lot of homicides in that region of um, part of Mexico City, you want to be very careful about your business there. Yeah, or of Mexico as a country, maybe. Um, so there are the number of people who get killed or assaulted. Then there is a cost to this life or to that injury or disability. And then there are some wider costs uh, to, to society. So what is this value of a statistical life? Surely a life is invaluable. What are you worth? Well, there's not a market that, luckily, you know, there is no market for human life. So, um, economists have come up, this goes back to Thomas Schelling, a, a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Um, so, he says, let's not think about a particular life, not about your life or a little nice brown-haired little girl's life or some old man's life, but we are thinking of a statistical life. So, how can we think of this? So you know that there's a one in a million chance of you dying in a particular job, yeah? An oil rig or on a production line or something like this. And you say, okay, I need to have 10 extra dollars um, per hour, per, per, per day, you know, depending on the type of job, um, for me to accept this risk. And when you multiply this out, then it would be, 10, uh, 10 um, million for the risk of certain death. Of course, nobody enters that bargain. You don't sort of say, I give you my life for 10, 000, um, for, for, for 10 million dollars, sorry. Yeah? It's a different bargain you would take. It's a sort of like there's a one in a million chance that I'll die on this job and therefore I want to have this premium of 10 dollars. Yeah? But this is fundamentally how this value of a statistical life is um, looked at. And these come from um, labor markets. So you can look at, you know, what is the risk in an industry and what sort of premium do people get to work in these risky jobs. Yeah? And so this is, this is how economists basically um, figure out what the, what the value of a statistical life is. You could, of course, say, let's just look at life insurance. Yeah? If you need a number, what your life is worth. But in a lot of um, countries, the life insurance is really very much a, um, a pension plan. Yeah? You, you, you get paid out you know, at a certain age. So it's not, you know, and it's about optimal bequests as well, rather than um, um, a trade-off between life and money. You can also look at compensation payments in courts. Yeah, you sustained an injury, so you know you lost an arm. Um, you know how much is that um, compensated with? And also, there are certain product liabilities. Yeah, where companies pay you because you've sort of um, had some problem with with their product. So. You can either look at the that ma information that markets provide you with, yeah? so this is implicit, and from, these imp from this information you sort of calculate the 10 million um, for life, or you could of course ask people. You can sort of say, what are you willing to, you know, what do you think the risk is, you know, that you get killed on the way from the university to your home, um, and how much would you be willing to pay for this? Yeah? 
um, to, to, to minimize this, this risk. And you, so this is also a willingness to pay method or contingent valuation, if, you, if you've ever come across these words. Um, interestingly, these sort of, when people are being asked how much are you willing to pay for lowering these risks, they, t they come up with much bigger numbers because you might think now eight or nine million US dollars for a human life is a lot. Yeah, because you've already seen how many dead people I've counted. So I'm going to come up with really big numbers in a minute. Um, but if you use this sort of how much are you willing to pay for it, you come up with even bigger numbers. Yeah? So the, the, the value of a statistical life gives you some sort of idea of how much a society would be willing to spend to avoid that particular loss of life. Good. Um, the problem is, of course, should we use these labor market data, yeah, working on an oil rig, I said, um, to come up with these assessment of a dread risk. People dread um, being killed in a violent incident much more than an accident. There are certain things that people dread, again, statistically speaking, much more than other things. Yeah. And so maybe we're even underestimating this um, um, value of a statistic life because we are looking at labor market data and not at the sort of dreadful risks. Okay. Um, let me maybe, um, in the interest of time, not go too much into all of these um, uh, details and show you some, some calculations. So I'm going to sort of give you the, the collective violence and from from crime, yeah, this, this homicides and assaults. Um, this is work from the um, Institute for Economics and Peace, um, and the human costs are, of course, the people who are killed in wars. We do not have good statistics on how many people get wounded, because of course people don't all get killed outright. They also have long-lasting disabilities. Um, um, through, through war. We do have quite good, yeah, I showed you the graph of the Congo um, income that took a big dip. We have got very good calculations here for the economic costs. Um, from criminology, we've got this sort of value of a statistical life where we can approximate pain and suffering um, from homicide and assault. And we've got tangible costs, so uh, what does it cost to sort of have this person medically looked after, what does it cost to apprehend uh, a killer, incarcerate them, and so on. But we do actually have very little in this type of literature, because these are mainly criminologists who do this, um, on the economic externalities. Yeah, My example of if it's a really dangerous part of the city, you don't want to set up business there. You want to have set up your business in a, in a safer place. So this is a billion of US dollars. So this is from the Institute for Economics and Peace. Um, we have um, the biggest number really from the deaths. Yeah, in civil conflicts, there's not much in, ter in terms of internal conflicts. Um, I said we don't have anything on injuries, um, so this is going to be an underestimate. Um, we also don't have anything on hunger and disease. Yeah, so these deaths are really is a relatively narrowly defined number. We do have really high numbers from these income losses. Yeah, a war is really development in reverse. Don't ever believe any, you know, freedom fighter uh, myths here. Um, everything's worse after civil war, yeah, and you don't get freedom either. Democracy is sort of not any better <laughs> after after these um, uh, conflicts. Of course, people don't only get killed; they also get di displaced, internally displaced people and refugees. And um, it's very difficult to put a number to this at the moment. Um, the literature puts some numbers from the UN. How much does the UNHCR spend on these refugees? 
if you've got any better suggestions, I'd be really keen to hear because it's very difficult to put a price on, on, on being, being a refugee. Because it's the um, uh, Institute for Economics and Peace, they have got something on terrorism there, but I think that should really be subsumed under um, collective violence here. So interpersonal violence comes up with a much, much, much bigger number. Yeah? And they are only looking at homicides and assaults. They don't look at domestic violence. Yeah? Um, and this number, again, basically intuitively is so much bigger because so many more people get killed. We don't have a number for economic costs really here. Um, because it's very unclear how to, um, how to estimate this. Maybe it's easier to have a look in a graph. So Jim and I then sort of said, what about the domestic violence? Because again, that is even so much more prevalent than a sort of assault. I have got, so on the motto of continuous improvement, we're still working on this topic. I've got better data on assault now. I think this light blue is going to be bigger uh, in the next wave of, of, of work. Um, because interestingly, people do ask women, researchers ask women, and they ask about children, but they don't tend to ask about men. So the whole sort of gendered perspective means that men, research on men is actually not as well advanced in, 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 in certain ways. But anyhow, Make of these numbers what you will. I don't want you to sort of go away and sort of say, this is what violence costs. Yeah? This is not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is to sort of say, what's big potatoes, small potatoes here? This is a big deal. Yeah? As was already said in the, in the introduction, we estimate, and we've always been very conservative in the numbers we use, that this is about 11% of world GDP, the size of it, nine and a half trillion US dollars. And collective violence, there I'm really certain, is only a small part of this. Homicides is much bigger and assaults. And then who knows, but because intimate partner violence and violence against children is so big, because it happens everywhere in every society, um, this is also, you know, the majority of the costs are due to this type of what happens. Yeah? So, I gave you three questions. I've got some answers now. Which societies have high costs of violence? Well, low-income countries. So, they're in a cycle of violence and poverty. So, the poorer you are, the more violent you are, and once you've been violent, you become poorer. In a war, this is really obvious and well-researched but I don't think it's terribly well researched with interpersonal violence. What really does it do to the productivity of women when they're being beaten at home? What does it do to a child that has got these adverse childhood experiences? Um, they, we know from cohort studies they are less likely to finish school, they're much more likely to be frustrated and aggressive and violent themselves. Um, they're more likely to enter sexual relationships very early on, have unwanted pregnancies, have HIV. Yeah? So there's a lot of developmental, in the terms of societal de developmental consequences that are not well understood at the moment. I think the medical profession has really understood violence as a public health problem. Yeah? It spreads like a disease, you need to contain it, you can address it, it's, um, it's important to sort of stop early. Um, but I think development experts in the sense of um, so, um, social scientists haven't really understood this terribly well yet. Which type of violence is most costly? No matter how you read the data and how you crunch the numbers, I'm convinced that interpersonal violence is much more um, um, costly. And who's most affected by violence? Well, in the homicides, remember this is men. But in the assaults, uh, again, I'm going to hopefully get some better data on assaults together and there's going to be a bit more men, but mainly it's women and children because it's in the domestic sphere where um, most violence is. So, 
last um, couple of slides. So if this is all so terrible, what can we do to reduce it? Because I don't want you to sort of leave here with all doom and gloom. Now, I've already said Ethiopia Eritrea was a good example where the international community has been very good um, in sort of uh, clamping down this, um, on this conflict. Most civil wars are in fact repeat civil wars. So we know where it's worthwhile to try and stabilize and put effort. And also interestingly, the longer the peace lasts, the more likely it, the country stabilizes. Yeah. And there's very good evidence that UN peacekeeping operations help. UN peacekeeping operations cost us, the global taxpayer, 7 billion US dollars a year. Um, this is not even half a percent of all military expenditure worldwide. We should really do more here. Um, because some of you might immediately think, oh, it's not always positive um, reporting on UN blue helmets. And that's true. In some situations, they've really not done the job properly, like Rwanda. Um, but they are, on the whole, statistically speaking, so I've, I've also done some, some research on, on, on this myself. I think UN peacekeepers do keep the peace, on average. Not in every case, but on average they do. So financing wars is, um, if you are a rebel leader and you want to sort of start up a movement, you need to finance this somehow. You need to sort of attract followers and, and, and have cohesion in your rebel movement. You have to re basically recruit a private army. And if you try and cut off this finance through natural resources, um, overseas diasporas, and so on, then um, you can cut off a lot of finance to these um, rebel movements. So that's important and that is, happen is happening. People can kill people in many different ways, but a really particularly lethal form of killing is through firearms. Yeah? And small arms and light weapons is the one um, method of choice in these um, so-called civil wars. Um, and we now have finally um, a UN arms treaty. Don't know at the moment whether it's really helpful. It's only been going for five years, not long enough to do a statistical analysis, but um, there's at least now a concerted effort, so that's very positive. What can you do about interpersonal violence? Because that's the big type of violence. Yeah. Um, of course, development. Development is going to take care of this. Yeah? The richer you are, the less violence of all types of violence you have in a society. But if you don't want to wait that long, if you want to do something now, what can you do? Um, you can, of course, say, ha, huh, I'm going to outlaw certain violent practices. So, for example, female genital mutilation, I'll just outlaw. And then it's not going to be a problem any longer. Well, all 26 countries in Africa where it's prevalent have outlawed it with no effect. Yeah? So that, that's not going to do it. If you've got um, traditional harmful practices and a modern legal system and really, there's really a big gap, you're not going to do it. Yeah? But we don't just have to sort of go back to, you know, to a really big thorny issue like um, female genital mutilation. I mean, in Germany, rape within marriage was only made an offence in, in the 1990s. I remember this. Yeah? This is unbelievable, but this was, you know, it took Germany a long time to sort of... Um, so legal reforms can help, but very often they are only mirroring developments in society, I think. Um, don't think that this is the only useful tool you can try and change norms and attitudes. So very interesting work um, um, in, you know, for example, there was, um, there's a soap opera on British um, BBC radio, and um, it's quarter of an hour every day, and it's been going on for a long time. And in this story of this soap opera, they wove in a story of domestic violence over months. This is very slow moving, this, this, this soap opera. Um, helplines in the UK had 20% extra calls. Yeah? So people do then talk about it and make this an issue. And in development, a lot of people are now trying to do this so sort of through infotainment. 
So I think that um, norms and attitudes can be changed. Yeah? Um, hitting children in Austrian schools was completely normal 50 years ago. Well, I don't know 50 years ago, but you know, um, we don't have to go that far back, really, um, where this was normal. And in Ugandan schools, this is the norm. But these norms can be shifted. Um, a lot of violence is, of course, intertwined with substance abuse. Um, so alcohol and drug programs can help. Differences in policing. Um, if you um, um, so, typically the police sort of use resources or used to just patrol randomly. <laughs> and this is what a lot of you know citizens sort of say the police should be doing. They want to be seen. But really smart use is to sort of go where the trouble is, hotspot policing. Um, and that can, you can do parenting programs. Parenting programs have sort of really um, shown big success um, in explaining um, about child development, um, that parents understand that better, what they can actually expect of their children, and also skills training. You know, how do you discipline a child without using force? Um, Intimate partner violence, um, the police has got a lot of programs now in a lot of different countries that when they're called to a domestic argument that they don't call it just a domestic, but they take it seriously and um, because this, these are alarm bells now ringing in a lot of countries. I want to leave you with a closing thought um, that violence is, of course, not only a human rights issue. Uh, so it's a violation of physical integrity, that's obvious. It's also a public health problem, um, as I mentioned before, but I really want us to sort of consider it much more of a development um, problem. And there I want to draw to the close. Thank you. Hope this works. Yeah. So thank you very much. That that was uh, uh, not only fascinating but also an eye opener. In, in particular, when you look at the um, the narrative that comes from research that has been done on the side of of uh, collective conflict. Right. If you think about the, the work of Steven Pinker or or the dissemination work that Max Roser is doing in in Oxford, uh, you get this idea. Well, we're living in the most peaceful times ever, and. Uh, uh, it is the case for collective conflict, but you you need to see it now in the in the perspective of the relative size of these two two chunks of of uh, violent behavior. So for me, also for somebody who has uh, worked also on on collective conflict issues, it, it was particularly fascinating. Thank you very much. I'm gonna uh, get uh, uh, questions from the audience. We will collect uh, a couple of them and uh, uh, have Anke. Uh, Answer them. There's a question there. Great. Hi. Uh, Josh Lang. First of all, congratulations uh, for both of you for your achievements. <clears throat> Sounds like a pretty special day today for both of your achievements and endowed professorship as well as a deputy director. Very interesting. Uh, I came here actually the opposite of uh, the other esteemed professor, very convinced of your arguments and actually became more skeptical <clears throat> because I'm wondering not only and I appreciate that you included uh, non-physical violence such as psychological aggression and other forms of violence which effectively cause all of the violence in the world but I'm just wondering about your solution because you're coming from Oxford Oxford University and I have a lot of good things to say because we have a partnership our company has a partnership with Oxford but which is the ivory tower, and you're suggesting that um, by changing traditions and cultures of violence, for example, uh, domestic violence or teen programs, that you're somehow going to save or uh, help these other cultures, these low-income economies, reduce their violence. I'm wondering, coming from the ivory tower of Oxford, which effectively, if I was wondering about an economist, if you would take more of a historical view on the causes of the violence in those low-income economies, particularly in relation to Mr. De Beers, who was a major donor at Oxford University and we know is the cause of the 
uh, blood diamond history, which is still effectively going on today. And that's a lot of violence that's caused by the colonialism and then neocolonialism that happened. And we know that um, in India there's a uh, great exception when you, when you talk about Gandhi and his position on nonviolence. So I'm wondering, be, just beyond the kind of general suggestions that you made, what's your specific position on nonviolence and how do we really get there? I think given the, the, the length of the question, you <laughs> may answer. <laughs> okay. um, maybe, maybe can, I, can I go to a, a slide or... Um, Sorry, your eyes are probably um, glazing over with all of this, but um, um, okay. So um, the person who's really written best about the sort of um, violence in historical context, I think, is Steve Pinker. Yeah, who sort of um, um, the better angels of our nature, where he sort of says that violence I is has really decreased all sorts of violence not only collective violence but collective violence has also recently gone up so um, exactly as he states in the book we can't just take it for granted it's not some natural law that we become all more peaceful so these are u.s homicide rates so in the 60s they really go up yeah and then in the 1990s they really go down yeah so these sort of fluctuate over time. If you have, I didn't bring that slide, but if you've got, um, um, this from like the Middle Ages to now, the Middle Ages were really, really violent period of time for, um, for Western Europe. We are living in a much more peaceful, you know, in a much more secure time now, yeah, because we haven't got wars and the homicide rates are down. And they can also really go down. We can now talk for a long time why this trend is more pronounced in the US, but in Western countries, you know, you can sort of say, is it about abortion, you know, the Levitt thing, you know, that these would be, you know, because it's been liberalized in the early 70s in the, in the United States and you don't have these delinquents. Is it the lead in the petrol? I mean, it, you know, you, you take your pick, you know, there's some wild theories out there, yeah? But these, these have gone down. Violence against children has gone down a lot. And now that your question is, you know, do these programs that have been developed for high-income countries work in low-income countries? Because parenting is different, culture is different, they've had a different experience of colonialism and so on. So, yeah, anthropologists, you know, sort of like really don't want to go there. But I edited a um, special issue last year in the Journal of um, European Development Research where exactly that was looked at. So take these parenting programs and take them to really tricky places like Liberia, Ugandan fathers and so on. And do they work in a very different context? And it seems to me that the little evidence that we have do work. You know, it does it does work even if you take them to a different context. Now, we could maybe improve them and do even better if we have them more context-specific, maybe, you know. But a lot of stuff that works in high-income societies does seem to work in low-income societies as well. So I'm very hopeful there because at the end, we're all humans, yeah. Um, and this sort of like hitting children, for example, in schools, S Sweden was the first country to abolish this, yeah, and make, really make this an issue. And so it starts in schools and then typically becomes outlawed in the home. And then after Sweden did it, the other Scandinavians did it, and then Germany did it. And then, you know, so it sort of spreads, you know, good practice spreads because you make the experience, these children actually learn better when they're not being hit. Yeah, it's a win-win for everybody. Um, and then these sort of um, things improve. Thank you. There's, there's another question there. Uh, hello. So my name is uh, Johannes Leutgeb. I'm, in, I'm an economist as well. And um, so uh, thanks a lot for your talk. That really, really strikes a chord with me, the numbers and um, the different examples and the wide uh, um, array, looking at the wide uh, landscape of violence that you're talking about. Um, 
but let me maybe let me be a bit provocative. So you were talking about violence is an inherently bad thing, and for example, you also talk about okay, let's find ways on how to disc, uh, to cut funds off from uh, rebels, for example, and. I can very much see that from our current perspective that would be, and in many developing countries, it might be an, a good thing, but without violence, there is no French Revolution, there is no American Revolution. Without the threat of violence, there might not be um, uh, an, any impetus for governments to, uh, to, to liberalize, to give people more opportunities. So I'm not an, I'm not a fan of violence, but isn't there as well a positive spin sometimes on the uh, question of violence? Thanks very much. The floor is yours. So in the historical context, I think you're right. Yeah, and you don't have to be a Marxist to sort of believe in the sort of di dialectic there. But um, yes, for sure, the extension of the franchise only ca came in Western European nation building and state building through exactly that. Um, but we now live in a different world. A, nation and state building worked very differently. Yeah? Um, colonialism was already mentioned. So this is very different. Um, Africa used to be a much more peace, so historically, Africa was a much more peaceful place than Western Europe. Western Europe, the, the Europeans were just at war with each other all the time. And then the Westphalian peace comes along and then the whole place becomes much more stable until, you know, in the last century, two big wars. But again, then stable. And Africa basically became much, much more violent in terms of, um, yeah. Um, but this violence, unlike Tilly's work, didn't ever lead to state building. Like in, in, in Europe, these states basically, apart from the few Luxem Luxembourgs and Liechtenstein, sorry if you come from these places, but these sort of more inefficient places were sort of subsumed in bigger countries, yeah, in, in, in sort of an state building exercise. And in Europe, this was always about, the war was very much about um, territory. Yeah, and securing the territory. But because of the geography in Africa, um, I don't know so much about Latin America, but in Africa, the geography and the climate makes it very difficult to project power. And this is why in most places you didn't have this state building because um, the moment you exercise power over people, people left. Yeah? And it was people scarce, land rich, but people scarce. So this is why you only have this sort of funny state carving up of Africa in the Berlin Conference. And interestingly, African independence around 1960 is essentially peaceful. Yes, there's Algeria and there are some bad examples. There are four or five bad examples out of basically 50 states. And the African leaders, the elite of that time, accepts the sort of colonial boundaries for a multitude of different reasons. But what actually de facto happens, like the col colonizers and all the African leaders before them, they never really project power over their, 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 their territories. And this is the opportunity then for these sort of civil wars. So I think your idea of the American Civil War and what goes on today in South Sudan are fundamentally completely different things. And the thing that goes on in South Sudan and any of these places is, 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 is not to be encouraged. Thank you. There's another question there, then there, then Billy. Uh, thank you. My name is Rosa Loga. I'm coming from practice. I'm a, the director of the Domestic uh, Violence Intervention Center in Vienna. And I'm also working um, uh, in, uh, in on the European level, there is a convention uh, to prevent violence against women and domestic violence from the Council of Europe. I, I don't know if you know about it. It's fairly new. And I'm in the committee monitoring uh, this convention. We have started with uh, a few countries. And so it's very interesting, this work that you're for us in practice, that, we, that you are doing also for the monitoring. Uh, that you're doing to, to cost violence, especially in this uh, field of, of um, um, uh, domestic violence and violence against women. Um, so thank you for, for this important work. I think it could also help the countries to monitor and also then to budget 
uh, the measures to counter it as a, as a next step. Um, I, I, I wanted to add, I'm, I, I think you, of course, you're right. Uh, I mean, your numbers speak for it uh, about uh, low income, uh, high violence, and the other way around. But I think in the area of violence against women, gen as gender based violence, we can also see other pictures. We can see high income countries with high violence against women, Saudi Arabia, for instance, or also Japan, for instance, is a country with relatively uh, low gender equality uh, um, uh, compared to the to the uh, to the high income, and also another question would be, uh, why is it that in high uh, income countries, uh, even if it's lower than in low incomes, the rate of violence, why is it still so high? Why is violence against women and domestic violence still so high in the rich and civilized countries? So there's another factor behind it. And uh, I think it, it's, the, it's the agenda inequality and the role it plays also economically in our societies. No? That, uh, uh, so my, my question would be also, uh, what do you think about, um, or um, the, the, the role that uh, um, um, civil society plays, that social movement plays, apart from the, from the richness of a country, uh, to uh, introduce change, the women's movement, the uh, uh, child protection movement as a factor that is additionally necessary uh, to the improving the income situation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So um, the argument that Pinker brings, you know, why um, countries so he basically only looks at Western countries, which spurned me to sort of, you know, look, look more globally. But the argument that he uh, puts forward is that we witnessed a rights revolution. Yeah, so a civil rights revolution, women's liberation and now gay rights. Um, um, and that, that is sort of driving, um, is the driving force behind lowering violence. But the interesting question that you're posing is sort of why is it that we're still experiencing a lot of violence in, in high-income societies? So women now have outside options and the violence is now lower than it used to be. Yeah? But why is it still there? Um, partly, you know, from feminist theory, this is um, you know, these are overhangs from a um, patriarchal system where it's a man's right and the ownership and possessiveness and so on. I mean, typically it happens, I mean, you probably know this much better than I do from, from, from your work. There tend to be, so one big point in time that is really da dangerous for a woman is breaking up with a partner. Yeah, so this is, this is where a lot of violence occurs and very often fi fatal violence and in pregnancy. Yeah. And so it's got something to do with being in a really, you know, sort of men feeling possessive, uh, fear of abandonment um, uh, because of a new baby or the woman leaving or, you know, if, you, if, if I can't have her, nobody can. The stalking, stalking is a very Im important issue with this controlling behavior. Um, I think, you know, education early or, you know, once this is an entrenched behavior, it's very difficult, I think, to reform these couples. Yeah, because typically also these couples try very often to sort of come together again. Um, I think the teenage programs and teenage violence, so dating violence in the countries where dating is, is possible, um, I think, so these are programs for 14, 15 year old boys and girls, just before they start forming relationships. These young relationships tend to be, statistically speaking, very violent, and very often not clear who the victim and perpetrator are, and very often this is substance abuse uh, related, yeah? And women are just not physically quite as strong, but as teenagers they're also not controlling their own behavior as well, men and as well as women. Um, and so this is very violent. But then the sort of, if you stay with this partner, that continues very often, or your idea about relationships are formed early on. And I think if we sort of try and sort of interview or make clearer to young men and women what is a consensual, um, an equal partnership, then I think we probably have the best inroad what to do with the sort of older ones, I'm really at a, at, a, at a loss. I think it's a very difficult and thorny issue. 
apart from substance reduce programs, the, these seem to really help with partnership violence. Yeah. We only have five minutes. Uh, I, I heard we have uh, to be very be punctual. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect the two last questions. And we're going to try to wrap it up in five Quicker. minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very quick. Um, so I'm from Canada, and I spent a little tiny bit of time in Uganda and a bit more time in Ethiopia. And I saw this this culture of uh, violence and how it's a bit more accepted. Uh, now coming from Canada, uh, we also are looking at indigenous rights and how uh, there's violence in the home. So these things are being very much paid attention to and very much calculated. However, when you look at the vast majority of people, uh, at least in, in, in Canada, it's not very com it's not very common to talk about those things. So even if people uh, were experiencing this domestic violence as children, I would say especially, um, you're not going to talk about that because, of course, you love your parents. There's a whole there's a whole dynamic there, of course. So so my question is, um, why is it so low? Actually, I was I'm wondering how how large could the discrepancy possibly be um, for the number that um, in high income places such as Europe, um, or most places in Europe and Canada. Um, yeah, what is the discrepancy? Uh, how, how high could it actually be because people are not speaking out uh, due to a number of factors because it's not being paid attention to or, uh, yeah, simply because it's just not, yeah, that's really my question. That's it. Just feel it there in the back and... Thanks. Thank you. I do have a very brief question. If we look to your numbers, then we can say the relation between uh, public violence and domestic violence, uh, collective violence and domestic violence is 1 to 50. Uh, if we read the newspapers, we get uh, simply the opposite impression. Can you say a few words on that? Excellent. So, um, you have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I mean, we can still go on afterwards, but <laughs> for this official part, you have three minutes. Uh, yeah. um, short questions, but um, and important ones, but difficult ones. So I think the two are connected. We don't talk about this violence. So like you're saying, a lot of children experience this is the primordial violence. It's the first violence most of us will have ever experienced is violence from your parents, yeah? Um, and we don't talk about it because it's quite normal, or I think the more normalized it is in a society, the less people talk about it, yeah? Um, and I think we should stop normalizing this, yeah? We should really do what we're doing now and talk about it and hopefully make it an issue and maybe, you know, pictures are being taken on the, on the website and so on. I mean, when I came up with these big numbers, um, CNN Business News asked me to talk about it. Now, you know, typically they don't do domestic violence. But the number really got them to think about it. And I've seen very interesting campaigns now that are in the, um, in the what's it called, the American, help me out here, the American Football Association organization. In their commercial breaks, they've got some adverts um, about domestic violence. And I don't know, Canada might have something similar. But I was really amazed how um, you don't see any violence so it can be watched by all the families that, you know, but it's really, if you're just listening to this and looking at it, you know immediately what this is about, and it's very smartly done, and you reach an enormous audience, yeah? Um, so I think the more we talk about it, and you're right, it's underreported, people don't st still don't talk enough about it, because the shame is there, um, you know, the Me Too campaign will hopefully help, uh, let's keep it going. Thank you very much, and it's a wonderful way of finishing the evening. Uh, actually not, we're not finishing the, the evening here, there's still evening going on in the room nearby where we have some drinks and food and where we can go on talking to each other and to Anke about violence and about many other things. Thank you very much for being here and see you in a minute. <laughs>